We concluded the last lecture with a discussion, a short discussion on the cost-benefit analysis. And I said that the cost-benefit analysis is demanding in terms of resources. Uh, and I explained to you that when we make a preliminary design, we need to have uh, uh, quicker options to estimate the design flow basing on the flow duration curve. So what are these quick options? There are some rules of thumb that we can use. So once the flow duration curve is estimated, depending on the type of use that we have to make for that water, there are guidelines for there are guidelines for estimating the design flow. For instance, if your water withdrawal fits uh, in a, a service, uh, an hydropower plant, there is a rule of thumb that says that the optimal design flow, which we indicate with the QP, is uh, the Q30 between Q30 and Q60. This is a rule of thumb, which means uh, that it's uh, the flow with uh, a duration of uh, 30 days. So, if you design your plant for such a duration, it means that on average, keep in mind that the flow duration curve gives you an average picture. On average, your plant works at full power on average 30 days a year. It means that in the remaining 335 days, it works at a reduced load. So, if we take QP corresponding to a duration of 30 days, the volume of water that we can pass through the turbine, through the plant, <coughs> is given by the integral <coughs> of the flow duration curve, as we discussed, which means that it's equal to the area that is below the flow duration curve and below the value of the design flow. And therefore, we are losing a volume of water, which is located in this uh, quasi-triangle here, quasi because it's not really a triangle, because this is uh, not a segment, but, by, but it's a curve. And uh, the volume of water given by, by this quasi-triangle here is lost, uh, simply because uh, it's given by river flows that exceed the design flow of the plant. <coughs> But there is to say that the actual situation is not this one because you have to take into account the environmental flow. You cannot take the whole volume of water that I put in evidence here because it means that if you took all this volume, it means that you would dry the river up for some days. So there is something that we have to subtract here. And to keep in mind, when I say that you are drying the river, you are not drying the river for the full duration. Because when you get in the high flow region, which means when you get into the 30 days, when the river flow exceeds the design flow, of course, you are forced to release some water into the river. So it means that for these 30 days, uh, you don't dry the river up if you take all the design flow. For the remaining days, yes, you dry it up. <coughs> there is also to say one more thing, and pay attention to this. I said that for 30 days, uh, I'm not drying the river, but still, for some of these 30 days, I am releasing downstream an excess flow that may be 
less than the environmental flow. So let's try to <coughs> understand what is the volume that I have to subtract from this area in order to release the environmental flow. So the first thing to do is to draw a line on the vertical axis corresponding to the environmental flow. Let me call it, mm, let me make another draw. Let me call it DMV. DMV because uh, in Italian it was called the flusso minimo vitale. Now it's not called like that because it's a, a bad name. And now it, it's called, uh, uh, it's called uh, the flusso ecologico or something like this in Italian. I don't remember if it is the flusso ecologico or the flusso ambientale. We need to check. But in the past it was called uh, the flusso minimum vitale, so minimum vital flow. And therefore the acronym that we use is still DMV. Okay, so let me draw again the flow duration curve here. Let me indicate QP here. The scale is not correct. I'm drawing in this way because I want to make a zoom in order to provide a clearer detail of this region of the graph. And then let me, let me put here the indication of the DMV. So, you could ask me, a good question would be, how do I estimate this DMV? How do I estimate the environmental flow? I think I already mentioned to you that you have some laws to refer to, and in Italy, the environmental flow is regulated by the regions, local administration, regional administrations, when I say region, it's something that uh, it's not fully understandable, the meaning for a person who lives abroad. Italy is administrated by splitting it in 20 parts. And uh, of course, uh, they are connected, but these are called our regional administration. Because as I said, Italy is split in 20 parts. And then inside the regions, there are local administrations uh, which are the municipalities. We had an intermediate level, which is still there up to five years ago. It's still there for some operations, but uh, formally we are going to abolish it. So basically, for now, we have two levels, uh, three national level, regional level, and local level. Municipality, municipalities, regions, and uh, the state. So, it is, uh, the estimation of the environmental flow is something that is delegated to the regions by the national law in Italy. So we have to look for regional laws in Italy for getting uh, the guidelines for estimating the environmental flow. And the regional law in our case is called uh, a Master Plan for Water Resources Management, which in Italian is Piano di Tutela delle Acque. And uh, if you look at the web, uh, there is uh, the plan with uh, the rules, uh, and the rules uh, uh, include the guidelines for the estimation of the environmental flow. <coughs> so, the moral of the story is that typically it's an empirical relationship that gives you the amount of the environmental flow. If there is a rule of thumb, again, which says that the DMV is almost equal to Q355. Of course, this works if the river is not intermittent. If it is intermittent, you cannot apply this rule of thumb. Because if it is intermittent, the Q355 is probably zero, and you cannot adopt an environmental flow that is equal to zero. But there is a good question. The good question is, for if a river is naturally intermittent, does it have a meaning, a sense? Is it 
sensical to adopt an environmental flow that is higher than zero, which means that you basically bring water to the river when in unimpacted conditions there wouldn't be. But this is what the, the law prescribes. So in some rivers, indeed, we are forced to release an environmental flow that is higher than the natural flow in the same season. And therefore, we have to accumulate water beforehand in order to be able to release it. Okay, so this is a order of magnitude. There is another rule of thumb that says that the environmental flow is a percentage of the average flow. I would say that it's something like 5% of the average, but I really don't remember if it is 2% or 5%. You can look for it. Anyway, I indicate the DMV here. So let me bring, let me draw an horizontal line corresponding to the DMV. Let me see if I have no. So basically, one could say one could say that I have to withdraw from this area, the area below this horizontal line, the area that is comprised between the horizontal line of the DMB and the abscissa. Actually. This is what usually happens, because we don't have a way, if our barrage from which we take the water is not regulated, we will see that we don't have a way to change the environmental flow depending on the river conditions. So actually, this is what usually happens. So we have to, in our estimate of the volume of water that is to bind, Keep in mind that it's important to estimate the volume of water that you turbine because it gives to you an estimate of the amount of energy that you can sell. So usually what we do is indeed to subtract from this overall volume, potential volume, to subtract the area here. But let's try to make things more complicated. Let's assume that we can regulate the environmental flow. So, indeed, there is no reason to release the environmental flow when the river flow exceeds the design flow. So, indeed, if we have the opportunity to regulate the environmental flow, it is not the whole volume that I highlight here that we have to subtract, but a reduced portion. How to compute it? Okay. In order to compute it, we have to take into account that we can close our environmental flow only when the river flow QT plus DMB is greater than QP. Which means that, uh, let me, let me uh, sorry, it's not like that. It's uh, like this. I need to correct it. QT is greater than QP plus DMB. So, when the river flow exceeds the design flow that we are taking plus the DMB, then we can close our gate of the environmental flow. Because this, basically, this uh, relationship means that if uh, I can write it in this way, QT minus QP is greater than DMB. So what is QT minus QP? It is the excess flow with respect to the withdrawal. When it is greater than the DMB, we can close the gate. OK, so when does this happen? In order to identify where does this happen, we need to find the, the time when the difference between QT, which is this one, 
minus QP is precisely equal to the DMV so from this time on we can close the gate and therefore this area becomes part of the volume that is turbined So, at this stage we are in this situation. We have a time where I, can, I need to release the environmental flow, which is given by this time span here. During this time span I need to release the environmental flow. And then I get to a time where I can close the gate. Actually, I could start closing the gate before then getting to here because I already have an excess flow up there that allows me to progressively reduce the environmental flow. So the moral of the story is that the area that I indicated with dot still can be reduced. How can I get an estimate then of the actual area that I need to release as environmental flow? Be careful, I need to get this volume here, up there. I need to get this area here, mirror it here. <coughs> I can turbine this area. And this is what you see in this picture. <coughs> Precisely the same thing that I have uh, highlighted here, and so the volume of water that can be turbined is this one. thing to understand is the mirroring of this volume. Try to think at it by reflecting on the fact that there is a point where the river flow starts exceeding the design flow and therefore there is a point where the river flow is already compensating your DMV. And there is another point where the river flow exceeds the design flow of an amount that is equal or higher than the DMV and therefore here you can close the DMV gate and in the previously identified point you can start closing the, date, the gate and therefore in this way you save this volume that can be turbined. You may think that this is a kind of nuisance meaning that this volume is uh, small. Indeed, if the river is large, and uh, which means that you have important flows, which means that this uh, volume of water that you turbine is really relevant, even such a small volume can make a difference. Okay. So again, what is this yellow area is the volume of water that you can turbine. If you divide this volume of water for the length of one year, you get the 
average turbine flow Q I don't remember if I called it QMP or QPM okay QMP this is the average turbine flow this can be compared with the average flow of the river average flow by the way There is no need that I tell you how to compute the average flow. Meaning that once that you have daily data, it's very easy for you to compute the mean. Okay? So there is no, no point to say, it, to, to say it. But there is an interesting thing that I may say. If I draw a flow duration curve, <coughs> I already told you that the area below the curve is the volume of uh, water that passes uh, along the river on average in one year. One question that I may ask you at the exam is, can you please highlight on the flow duration curve the average flow? And therefore, you may think, okay, the average flow is uh, in between zero and the maximum, of course, and you may say something like, okay, let's put it here. And I would say, look, this is not really a good estimate of the average. Why is that? Because uh, the area below the average should be the same area that is below the flow duration curve. The area below the flow duration curve is uh, an estimate of the volume of flow during the year. You can also compute the volume of flow by multiplying the average times the duration of the year. So, which means that the area below the average should be the same area as the one I highlighted here. Which means that, which means that this area here should have the same extension of this area here. which is not the case in the drawing that I did on the blackboard. Of course, you have to shift, in this case, the average down in order to increase the white area and to decrease the dotted area. So be careful about this possible question. Now, I said that the average turbine flow can be compared with the average flow and can be compared with the design flow, QP. In the technical practice, uh, when we design a water withdrawal, it is, uh, it is uh, frequent uh, to estimate the impact of the withdrawal on the river by computing two indexes, two technical indexes. The first is called uh, the water withdrawal index. So, water withdrawal index, which is equal to QP divided QM. This is higher than one, maybe higher than one, maybe. Typically it is, but not always. 
in general it is varying from zero to something that is theoretically unlimited. In general, from a technical point of view, it's higher than one. It depends on the shape of the flow duration curve, but usually, if you design, if you take SQP, the Q30, it is uh, the water withdrawal index is higher than one in general. And then there is a second index, which is the water use index, which is equal to QMP, average turbine flow, divided by QM. And this is always lower than one. Unless, uh, technically, it's always lower uh, than one. It is, uh, can be included in the range 0, 1. Cannot exceed 1. And in general, it's lower. Of course, for both indexes, if you are concerned about environment, you would like that they take a low value, both of them. If you are instead concerned about uh, the value of your investment, you tend to maximize both of them. So they are a good index for discussing, for trading uh, the optimal design flow. Keep in mind that when you get engaged in a discussion with stakeholders, with conflicting interests, it's always a very good idea to try to make your opinion objective. And the best way is to use quantitative assessment. So indexes have the nice feature of being easily understandable easy to explain, and they are objective. Okay, I think, uh, I think we can close here. And uh, the, my, no, not my lecture, sorry, close this topic. I, I still have 25 minutes to go. And uh, my presentation and most of the lectures continue with some examples that uh, um, of uh, hydropower plants that are uh, basically realized through this uh, through a water withdrawal. Keep in mind that uh, basically when you want to design hydropower plant, uh, there are two options to select. Uh, the first one is uh, to build a dam. The dam allows you to regulate the river flow, so you change the flow duration curve, basically. The other option is to build a run of the river hydropower plant. Run of the river means that you turbine water when there is water into the river, so you don't modify the flow duration curve. You take water without accumulation, or if there is accumulation, it's very reduced. So, the example that I'm providing here is related to the centrale of the Isola Serafini, let me see, on the Po River, which is a run of the river hydropower plant. I look at my slides because they are more detailed. And uh, what they did at Isola Serafini, this is another plant that if you had the opportunity to visit, it would be great. Okay, let's forget about this. And uh, this is, uh, these are pictures related to Isola Serafini. Basically, the situation was like this. Keep in mind that the Po River is the only European big river that is not regulated. So there are no barrages. The only one is Isola Serafini, but the regulation is uh, very limited. Basically, there was a meander like this along the Po River. 
This is a situation that occurs frequently in, uh, in uh, rivers that, uh, that flow with a very reduced slope in very flat areas. They look for the places where, for the, with the, the lower elevation, but as they flow, they also settle sediment, so they try to make their bed higher in elevation. And therefore what happens is that the flood occurs typically, the river breaks the Libyas and then takes another direction. And in this case, in, in, by following the places with the lower elevation, it is, uh, it is uh, a natural evolution of the river to, to travel by meanders. So basically what they did is, in this situation, they realized that a connecting channel here, they cut the meander, basically, and uh, of course there is an elevation difference between upstream and downstream, and uh, they used this elevation difference, uh, still are using this elevation difference to produce hydropower. And in order to manage this situation, they built a gate on the meander and a gate on the channel. So by closing both these gates, they can raise the level of the Paul River upstream. And they decide when they need energy, they open the gate of the channel. And therefore, they use the difference in elevation to turbine. When and, and the turbines are here, the plant is here. And uh, when they don't need to produce energy, they close the gate of the channel, open the other gate, and leave the water flowing in the natural meander. Of course, uh, everything needs to be well managed. They cannot afford of uh, uh, not releasing water in the meander for a long time. There must be a minimum amount of flow that is released in the meander, otherwise, you easily understand that there is a there is an impact on the ecologic uh, environment of the river, and uh, but in this way it, it was a good idea because of course uh, they can produce uh, power and uh, let me, this is uh, bigger. In this case, you can see the flow duration curve in black. Of the river. You see that there is the design flow here and also they indicated here the upstream water level which is kept more or less constant and the downstream water level. What happens is that when you have higher flows the downstream water level is higher and so the hydraulic jump is reduced and you get less energy. But on the other end, you have an higher flow because the design flow is, uh, uh, is given entirely and therefore the energy increases. So they plotted here the power duration curve, which is uh, basically for each day of duration. So from uh, the duration of one to the duration of 365, they obtained the red curve by assuming that they can turbine the river flow corresponding to the given duration with a maximum of 1,000. This river flow multiplied by the jump, which is indicated here, it's the difference between these blue lines, and you see that it's lower here and then rapidly increases, and then, and then it gets a bit uh, higher and higher as the river dries up by, as I said, by multiplying the flow that is turbined in each day times the jump, they get the red curve. I wouldn't call it a power duration curve because uh, a duration curve by definition is always decreasing. In this case, uh, you, you, see, you see a duration curve it is a duration curve, but they should shift the abscissa. Anyway, this is giving for each day an estimate of the power that you get. Okay, now, before I pass to groundwater, I just wanted to show you, on my website there is this picture, which is not really a picture, it's uh, an insert from Google Maps, uh, 
which uh, depicts uh, a barrage along the Danube where they built uh, an hydropower plant uh, and in this case as well they are turbining depending on uh, the amount of flow that flows into the river. We will uh, dedicate some time to describing these plants uh, in detail, how to design them. Uh, I think it is interesting this picture because uh, you can zoom it uh, and uh, you can also see the details uh, and uh, which is interesting because you can see also the navigation. Here they are. This is uh, the way the boat follows to bypass the plant. Uh, and this is called the navigation. I don't remember if it is navigation gate, I think, navigation gate, it's called Camera di Navigazione in Italian, and the navigation gate is a gate that allows uh, boats to bypass these plants, uh, which is uh, indeed needed because you have to make sure that the navigation is allowed. And uh, if you get a look, I think it is interesting, and then we will see more details and what follows. Okay, now let me concentrate uh, on groundwater, because we are still talking about the inductive assessment. And inductive assessment, uh, I remember, I remind you, that means uh, that we are getting an estimate uh, of water resources availability by observations. So we look at the output from the process, as I said, and then we, from the output, we get an estimate of water resources availability. So. For surface water, it's easier than for groundwater, as I mentioned to you already, because it's easier to observe surface water. And also, it is uh, surface water, besides uh, being more easily observable, has also another nice feature that uh, the flow is faster. Time to basically recover 